Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Craft Beer and Trivia Partnership Program between the Asheville Art Museum and Burial Beer. My name is Devin Farrow. I'm the External Affairs and Communications Assistant at the museum, and tonight I will be your quiz master. Please note that we are recording this evening's program, so if you prefer not to appear in the recording, please be sure to turn off your video. We are thrilled to welcome everyone this evening. And although we can't be together, our favorite watering hole for a pub quiz, we have a great evening planned for you tonight. While Perspective Cafe on the museum's rooftop is closed, our partners at Food Experience are offering great food for curbside pickup. And you can order some of your favorite beer from Burial's Tap Room. They have a fantastic selection of beers. And if you weren't able to pick one up tonight, I strongly encourage you to place an order with them online soon. Now, I'd briefly like to go over the flow of tonight's program. There will be four thematic rounds of trivia focused on American art and craft with bonus questions about craft beer. This is Asheville Beer City, after all. There are two ways to play. First, you can make it a friendly competition with those at home with you or test your knowledge on your own. We'll review answers from the previous round before each new round so you'll be able to track your own scores we sent out a score sheet with your confirmation, or you can, of course, use scratch paper. Or alternatively, you can play for prizes against other participants playing from home tonight. If you want to play competitively, please be sure to answer through the polls, which we'll post on the screen, like the one you should see very shortly. There you go. <laughs> Once a poll is closed, we can't reopen it. So make sure you get your answers in on time. We recommend that those playing competitively also keep track of your answers at home with your, our own score sheet or the scratch paper. Because, well, this is our first time and we're, of course, not computer experts and glitches do happen. Scores will be tallied after the program. We'll post the names of first, second, and third place winners on our website and social media tomorrow. We'll email winners as well to make arrangements to collect your prize. First prize will be two general admissions tickets to the museum for use after we reopen. If you're already a member, the good news is you can use these to bring guests or give them as gifts. Second prize is a burial beer t-shirt. Third prize is an Asheville Art Museum pint glass with our burial beer can design. Both the second and the third prizes were designed by one of tonight's featured art artist, David Paul Seymour. Between rounds, we're going to hear from Hayden Wilson, a local glass artist that you may know from museum's opening exhibition, Appalachian Now. We'll also visit with our friends from Burial Beer, David Paul Seymour, who designed the can for Burial Beer's Spiral Man for the museum. Finally, assistant curator Whitney Richardson will speak about some bar themed items in the museum's collection. Before we get started, I'd like to know if there are any questions and you can enter them at any time in the chat box. If not, we can get started with round one. All right, isms. Round one is all about isms. Anyone who started studied art history or walked through a museum knows that art is full of them. Isms are words that describe different movements or styles in art. For this round, we'll ask five questions about our isms. Each question will have four possible responses given in a multiple choice format. Our ism questions will be followed by a bonus question about craft beer. I'll read each question twice. The second time I read each question, a poll will appear on the screen. Those who are playing competitively at home should click on the response at that time. The poll will stay active for a few seconds after I finish reading each question. Okay, question one. Benjamin West, John Singleton Copley, and Charles Wilson Peale were known for their works in this 18th century style, which celebrated the ideals of ancient Greco-Roman line, proportion, and storytelling. Is it A, Impressionism, B, Neoclassicism, C, Realism, or D, Romanticism? Benjamin West, John Singleton Copley, Charles Wilson Peale were known for their works in this 18th century style, 
which celebrated the ideals of ancient Greco-Roman line for portion and storytelling. Is it A, Impressionism, B, Neoclassicism, C, Realism, or D, Romanticism? Question number two, also called action painting, this 20th century style emphasized the act of creation and the artist's emotions while painting over a meticulously planned composition. Is it A, abstract expressionism, B, cubism, C, existentialism, or D, syncretism? Question again. Also called action painting, this 20th century style emphasized the act of creation and the artist's emotion while painting over a meticulously planned composition. A, abstract expressionism, B, cubism, C, existentialism, or D, syncretism. Question number three. Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings of enlarged flowers, New York skyscrapers, and New Mexico landscapes earned her the nickname the mother of North America of, of American thisism. A. Chromatism. B. Futurism. C. Modernism. D. Pointillism. Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings of enlarged flowers, New York skyscrapers, and New Mexico landscapes earned her the nickname, the mother of American this-ism. A, chromatism, B, futurism, C, modernism, or D, pointillism. Question number four. Regionalism, a style exemplified by Thomas Hart Benton, John Stuart Curry, and Grant Wood, is best remembered for scenes of rural life in this part of the United States during the Great Depression. A, Midwest, B, New England, C, South, D, Southwest. Regionalism, a style exemplified by Thomas Hart Benton, John Stuart Curry, and Grant Wood is best remembered for scenes of rural life in this part of the United States during the Great Depression. A, Midwest, B, New England, C, South, D, Southwest. Question number five. This activist movement, which incorporates elements of anti-capitalism, environmentalism, solidarity, or third wave, third wave feminism, transforms traditional domestic arts into statement pieces. A, craftivism, B, Dada, C, land art, or D, minimalism. This activist movement, which incorporates elements of anti-capitalism, environmentalism, solidarity, or third wave feminism transforms traditional domestic arts into statement pieces. A, craftivism, B, Dada, C, land art, D, minimalism. Okay, now for our round one bonus questions provided by Burial Beer. What is the difference between an ale and a lager? Is it A, ales are higher in alcohol content than lagers? B, 
lagers are made with wheat malt, ales are not. C, lagers are cold fermented, ales are hot slash warm fermented. What is the difference between an ale and a lager? A, ales are higher in alcohol content than lagers. B, lagers are made with wheat malt, ales are not. C, lagers are cold fermented, ales are hot, warm fermented. All right, everyone, that's the end of round one. Great job. I hope you had fun with our first round. We are now ready for our first break. And let's welcome Hayden Wilson. Hayden is a glass artist native to Western North Carolina. His work was recently on view at the museum in our opening exhibition, Appalachia Now, an interdisciplinary survey of contemporary art in Southern Appalachia. Please feel free to put any questions in the chat box that you would have for Hayden. We'll have time for that at the end. Hello, can you hear me? Hi Hayden, how are you? You can all hear me? I've got these uh, speakers on. Welcome <laughs> to my studio. Um, I gotta flip my camera around. So here's my studio. We're gonna make a glass, a pint glass for you in seven minutes. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to my quarantine mate, my uh, photographer here, and we'll get started with a blowpipe. Okay, so I've got my blowpipe here. Can you still hear me? Yep. <laughs> All right, so this is the furnace. It's got my molten glass at about 2,000 degrees. So I'm gonna dip the blowpipe into that molten clear glass, much like gathering honey. And I gotta keep it turning, because if I don't, it starts dripping. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna roll it on this steel table called a Marver. And I'm just looking for a nice, even, smooth, round gob. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blow air into the end of this blowpipe and you'll see the bubble come out into the glass. Woo! Now I'm gonna go into this optic mold here to give it these little dimples. This is called a pineapple mold. So you can see right there, I've got these individual dimples. If you wanna look inside that mold, you can see the bronze mold and it has all these little dimples in there that created Nice even dimples here on this bubble. So what's gonna happen is when I gather another gather a glass, it's gonna trap a little bubble in each of those. And I gotta let this cool down so it doesn't deform too much when I go for my other gather. What I'll do is I'm going to gather another layer of glass and I'm going to use this wooden block to smooth it out and then we'll start, that'll give me enough glass for the final pint glass shape. So far so good? Okay. So we're going to dip into this furnace again, gathering another layer of molten clear glass. And as you see, it's trapped a little bubble in each one of those little valleys. And use this block to cool it off a little bit, create a skin on that gather, but also just to smooth it out and redistribute the glass where I want it. So these are cherry wood molds that are, um, soaked in water so the glass doesn't burn it because it's riding on a, an insulating layer of steam. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into my reheating furnace here. I'm gonna put on my blow hose because we can't share pipes these days. So I'm gonna be able to inflate it myself by having this blow hose hooked up to my blow pipe. So I'm gonna give it a good heat. I'll come out, block it again.
I can use gravity to kind of elongate it a little bit. Use my tool to help shape, pull some of that glass down to the bottom. Square up my bottom a little. And now we're ready to glow into the blow mold. So we have a mold here, my flight glass mold, right there. So what it does is I can drop my mold directly into that, and when I blow and turn, it'll give me my pint glass shape. So I want to get my glass bubble really nice and hot. And then I'm going to come over. Can you shut the mold for me? Well, actually, this is one hand. Yep. Okay, open. And we've got our point glass shape. So now I can kind of shape the sides a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to put a little restriction in here, right where I want the lip to be. What that's going to do is that's going to tell the glass where I want it to break free from the blowpipe. So right here, that's called a jack line. All blown work, for the most part, needs a jack line to break free from the blowpipe. So our next move is going to be the transfer. I have a solid rod that I got waiting up preheating in my pipe warmer here. So I made this. It's just a little gather of glass on the end of a solid rod. I'll put that in here and start preheating it. We'll give this glass a little flash. Can you hear me still? We can. Okay, good. <laughs> I feel like I'm yelling. Okay, so I want to keep this rolling because it'll kind of get off center if I don't. Okay, we're nice and preheated. I'll let it flip. I'll flip it over. And I want to center this close as I can to the bottom there. I get a little water out of the bucket. I'll put a little water on that restriction and that'll give it some thermal stress. And with a little tap, it breaks free. So all this clear glass gets remelted. So anything that's on the end of that pipe, I can remelt. And now I've got the cup attached to the blow pipe and there's a little hole that will heat up and try to flare out into the final shape. I need to center it up a little bit. Okay, how are we doing on time? We're doing great. All right. I think honestly they'd want to see you this entire time. Oh, I know, but the glass is so much more fun than me. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm doing right now is just focusing the heat right on that, right on that lip. We'll trim it for you too, because that's one of the my favorite parts is cutting glass with shears. So when I get it hot enough, I don't know if you can see what's going on in there. Yeah. And I'll come out. I use my tweezers here. to thin that lip, and I'll use my shears to cut that excess glass off, and try to do it nice and evenly. Okay, so now I'll heat that lip one more time, and we'll flare it open into our pipe glass. Whee! All right. <laughs> and this
Hayden, are you still there? Did you freeze? <laughs> oh no, we thought the glass was warm enough. Keep it from freezing on Zoom. Maybe he'll come back. I know everyone loves Zoom and all of its technical issues. Well, with this kind of glitch, uh, I think we should go ahead and review our answers for round one. That sounds good with everybody. All right. So round one, question one, 18th century American artists West, Copley, and Peel were neoclassicists. Question two, the answer was abstract expressionism. We have a few great examples of abstract, can't talk tonight, you guys, abstract expressionism work in our collection. Question three, Georgia O'Keeffe, has been called the mother of American modernism. Question four, the regionalists largely showed scenes of the Midwest. In fact, all three artists mentioned in question were native Midwesterners. Benton was from Missouri, Curry from Kansas, and Wood from Iowa. Question five, the answer was craftivism. And finally, the bonus question, what is the difference between an ale and a lager? The answer is, lagers are cold fermented, whereas ales are hot or warm fermented. How did you guys do? Feeling pretty confident for round two? Ready to get started? All right, well here is a little bit about round two, which happens to be my favorite round. Round two looks at art and popular culture. Do you have favorite movies, books, or plays about artists? Some of your favorite musicians might be artists, art collectors, or actors on the side. Let's see what you know. Okay, question number one. This pop artist not only managed the rock band, the Velvet Underground, but also created cover art for 53 albums spanning rock, jazz, classical, and pop music. Is it A, Andy Warhol, B, James Rosenquist, C, Robert Indiana, or D, Roy Lichtenstein? Question again. This pop artist not only managed the rock band, The Velvet Underground, but also created cover art for 53 albums spanning rock, jazz, classical, and pop music. Is it A, Andy Warhol, B, James Rosenquist, C, Robert Indiana, or D, Roy Lichtenstein? Question two. This actress played the eponymous strip painter's wife, fellow artist Lee Krasner, in the 2000 biopic Pollock. A, Amy Madigan, B, Jennifer Conley, C, Marcia Gay Harden, or D, Stephanie Seymour. This actress played the eponymous strip painter's wife, fellow artist Lee Krasner, in the 2000 biopic Pollock. A, Amy Madigan, B, Jennifer Conley, C, Marcia Gay Harden, or D, Stephanie Seymour. Question number three. The play Red about this Latvian American painter debuted in 2009, starring Alfred Molinia and Eddie Red Redmayne, and went on to win the Tony for Best Play the following year. A. Arsha Gorky, Ilya Bodolowski, C. Mark Rothko, or D. Vasily Kandinsky. The play Red about this Latvian American painter debuted in 2009, starring Alfred Molinia, 
Eddie Redmayne and went on to win the Tony for Best Play the following year? A, Arshel Gorky, B, Ilya Bodolowski, C, Mark Rothko, or D, Vasily Kandinsky? Question number four. This entertainment mogul purchased Carrie Jane Marshall's pastimes at auction for a record-breaking $21.1 million in 2018. Not only a career-high price for Marshall, but also the most paid for a living African-American artist. A. Diddy. B. Jay-Z. C. Kanye West. Or D. Swiss Beats. This entertainment mogul purchased Carrie James Marshall's pastimes at auction for a record-breaking $21.1 million in 2018. Not only a career-high price for Marshall, but also the most paid for a living African-American artist. A. Diddy. B. Jay-Z. C. Kanye West. Or D. Swiss Beats. Question number five. Known primarily for his genre bending music, this artist sold watercolors to drug dealers in the 1990s and also appeared in the TV series Sons of Anarchy. Is it A, David Bowie, B, Marilyn Manson, C, Moby, or D, Rob Zombie? Known primarily for his genre bending music, this artist sold watercolors to drug dealers in the 1990s and also appeared in the TV series, Sons of Anarchy. A, David Bowie, B, Marilyn Manson, C, Moby, or D, Rob Zombie. All right, now time for the bonus round question number two provided by Burial Beer. Where are the most hops in the world grown? A, Germany, B, New Zealand, C, the USA. Where are the most hops in the world grown? A, Germany, B, New Zealand, or C, the USA? Wonderful. Okay. All right, everyone. That was the end of round two. How are you guys holding up? Is everyone having a good time? I hope you're sipping lots of beer. We are now going to take our second break, and it's my pleasure to introduce artists David Paul Seymour and Chris McClure, who is the Director of Brand at Burial Beer. Last November, when the museum reopened after a construction and expansion project, we collaborated with Burial to launch Spiral Man Lager. David, please tell us about that project and how Burial and David worked together to make this unique and memorable beer can art. Um, is it just me or Chris on here too? Hi, everybody. Hi, David. I think Chris should be on here. Are you oh. here, Chris? I'm here, but uh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Welcome. He's, he's like sitting right over here next to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I guess I could speak to it, Chris, unless you want to. Yeah, please do. Oh. Um, yeah, so, you know, hi, I'm David Paul Seymour. I'm a freelance illustrator, and, um, you know, you guys probably all know the work I do for Burial Beer. I do all their packaging design and actually live here in Minneapolis and uh, I've been working for burial for or with burial for I guess this is year seven and uh, um, I was I was like anticipating jumping into a, uh, a whole thing but um, so about the the can we did for the museum um, and I, I'm really I really feel terrible because I'm drawing a blank on um, her name but the artist who um, 
they came to me and said, here's her body of work and it's really important to Asheville, um, you know, folk artist. Somebody help me out with the name. Lorna um, Halper. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> so they, you know, they, they said, they, they kind of dove me into her body of work and, and, and I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time looking at it. And the idea was for me to step away from myself and like what I normally would do as my style and, and whatever for burial and, you know, really dig into her, I guess, body of work and her style and sort of try to mimic that and pay homage to it. And um, I, I hope I did a good job doing it. It's, it's really taxing for one artist um, to try and, and, pay homage in that kind of way to another visual artist it's like kind of doing a good job at like maybe a musician who has to do a cover of another band song or something like that you you want to do it justice and in this case you know it wasn't a thing where it's like i'm going to put my own spin on it i really tried to be faithful to um her style and her color palette and um you know and also make a great can you know so um um, David, yeah, I think I we have your slides again. ready if you'd like us to pull those up. Yeah, well, I wanted to say a couple of quick things before that, if I okay. got a few minutes. Um, you should be sure, of time. course, yeah. Um, anyway, so I was saying, like, you know, I started with Burial. This is like year seven, and, and, and I'm really proud of the relationship I've had with them and your guys' community. I mean, I live here in Minneapolis, but I've, you know, been out to Asheville a few times, and you know, every time I've gone, I get treated like a prince, you know, and it's like really cool and, and it's a great environment. And um, I, I really love Asheville and, and I love being a part of burial and in some small way, the burial art community. So I appreciate everybody giving me the time to speak. And, um, you know, I do I do a lot of like heavy metal stuff for um, heavy metal bands, you know, album covers and t-shirts and stuff like that. But um, you guys all pretty much know the work I do for burial, I would assume, is like predominant in your mind. So I wanted to just take a minute and explain. I thought it'd be interesting maybe to explain like how, how that like works um, because I typically do like at least a can art, you know, project for burial like every week. So um, it, it's a really fun, really fast paced kind of process. And so I brought some slides in to show you guys kind of how that process works. Um, and if, if we go to the first one, so what usually pops into my inbox at the beginning of the week is something like this. It's like a written brief, as we call it in the biz, and it just outlines like, hey, you know, this is what we want. These usually come from uh, um, Doug Reeser, who's the, you know, the main owner guy of Burial, and this guy's a nut. He comes up with some crazy stuff every week for me to do, and, and I just love it. He kind of keeps me on my toes, so... He'll send something uh, verbally written over that. Don't feel like you got to sit and read it all because we'll, we'll kind of go through the meat and potatoes of it here in a bit. So the, basically I was asked uh, to do uh, this concept. I think it's easier to explain in the next slide um, just visually um, than to try to sit and read all that or for me to read it out loud to you guys, but if you probably read some of it. So this here was kind of like a – what I, you know, would call like a doodle, you know, it's just an original, you know, like a first step and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking, kind of, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this going in the right direction? And, you know, you, you know, it, it could either be a yes or a no. In this case, it was more or less a yes. So this was a quick just study, you know, and this probably took like literally, you know, 30 seconds or two minutes maybe to do. And you know, take a photo of my phone and send it over for approval to go to the next step. So if you go to the next slide, so this would be more of a formalized sketch. And this is very atypical of like what I would send in to burial for um, a prelim sketch, um, you know, to say, hey, um, what do we need to tweak on this? So in this particular case, I'll call your attention to the legs of the lamb hanging down. The comments or the feedback were like, hey, the, these legs are really scrawny and, and skinny, um, you know, and they're, they're not going to work. Usually stuff that's like on a, you know, butcher's hooks are got a little more fat on them or whatever, you know. 
So the whole idea here was we wanted to create a scene where if you squint your eyes and you look back, and I encourage you all to do it, you're seeing just a complete lamb. But if you really look at it, you know, it's broken into two planes. You've got the stuff happening above ground, which is a lamb lying in this beautiful field of flowers and mushrooms. And then, but then below, you've got like the ceiling of an old timey, like butcher's kind of cavernous workspace with all his tools hanging. And then he's got the cuts of meat hanging. It's, it's gruesome, I know, but it's what we do. Uh, but um, so the, the feedback on this first sketch was, hey, the legs are pretty wimpy. So if we go to the next one. <laughs> so then they were like, yeah. So, so then it was, well, hey, man, you really took it too far now. I, and that's why I want to use this project as an example, because it, it, it can really show you how the artist and, 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 you know, the client working together, in this case, me and Burial, has our back and forth and we try to we try to arrive at, at common ground and the one here was like now you've blown the whole effect of squinting your eyes and seeing a complete lamb now these things are way too fat and too meaty it doesn't work so then you got to go but everything else looks cool let's keep that so then you know you go to the next slide and which is me going to the next process um, and turning this in and it was kind of arriving at a, um, you know, a little bit of a, um, you know, okay, we'll meet in the middle here because what, what we ultimately realized we wanted was we just wanted these to look more like they were skinned, less furry, maybe a little beefier at the top, but not a lot. You kind of went way, way too far. So the idea was that, you know, these were just um, how they would look in a butcher shop. There's no fur on them. They've been skinned and that kind of thing. So this was good. This was approved. Uh, I think this was the one where it said, hey, let's, let's go forward and, and complete it. So before we go to the next slide, I, I guess, you know, for those of you who are wondering, like, this doesn't, sketch doesn't turn into a final piece of art. I, I, I what's called inking, is actually goes back to old illust timey illustrator and even comic book days where, I literally use pen and ink or brush and ink, India ink, and, and I'll ink this sketch over the top of it, get nice crisp blacks and uh, line work that I can scan in. And then all the coloring I do for burial projects and most of the projects I do uh, is done digitally in, in, a, in a program called Photoshop. So this was approved to go to the inking phase. Um, I don't I think the next slide is just a completely finished product, but if we go to that, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can zoom that in just a titch more, but um, so that that's like, this is completely done and ready to go to kind of a final layout on burials in for, for a can. Um, and uh, this has been inked and it's been colored and this is kind of a mock-up on a, a faux aluminum background, you know, just to kind of mimic how it would look on the can. Because <clears throat> for this particular one, we wanted the entire, I guess, sky area above the, the field to just be blank can. And then everything below would be kind of like it's underground, like dark and kind of dirt. So this is a combination of, of like I said, uh, literally inking by hand scanning it in and then all the coloring is uh is done digitally uh, kind of digitally painted in photoshop so um this is pretty typical uh the only thing i didn't show is um uh at after that stage um when that part is approved i would do um like uh what we call the ribbons which is um you know when i when i just draw the name of the beer kind of in these like tattoo ribbons and I scan that in and put that over the top and then send that away and it's done. So um, that's really the, the process from start to finish and like how, how we do what we do each week. Um, that's a really truncated kind of quick explanation of it, but there, you know, there's a really a ton of back and forth all week long about like just sometimes it gets into the most subtle little detail but um that that's a pretty easy way to describe what we do each week so and now be time to mute me because it sounds like my beer delivery is here 
So. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. If you guys have further questions, I saw a few pop popping up in the chat. If you have a few um, that you want him to answer, we'll have time for more Q&A in a little while. But now let's review answers from round two before we start round three. So round two, question one, the answer was Andy Warhol. Does anyone remember the bold yellow banana on the Velvet Underground's album cover? It's a little before my time, but my parents were sure to make sure that I knew about this. Uh, question number two, Marcia Gay Harden played Lee Krasner and Pollock. In fact, all the actresses mentioned were in the film, so it's a little tricky. Question three, the play Red is about Mark Rothko. And it was quite the debut cast, I'd say myself. Question four, this one was even more tricky. While all the entertainment moguls mentioned are serious art collectors, the correct answer is Diddy. In fact, Swiss Beats helped advise Diddy in the purchase of this painting. Question five, the answer was Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson's paintings have sold for upwards of $100,000. Wow, I could not even believe it myself. And finally, the bonus question, where are the most hops in the world grown? The answer is the US, specifically Washington State. How did you guys do? Did we stump you yet? Are you ready for, for round three? Well, let's get started. It wouldn't be art and craft trivia if there weren't a visual round. So for round three, in addition to asking you a question, we'll show you an artwork related to each question. As before, I'll read the question once and I'll also show you an image. The poll for responses will appear on the question second reading. Okay, let's get started. Here's question one. Emmanuel Loitza painted George Washington's crossing of this river during the Revolutionary War at least twice in the mid-1800s. It has been copied, reimagined, and even parodied by generations of artists since. A, Delaware River, B, Hudson River, C, Mississippi River, or D, the Potomac River. Emmanuel Loitza painted George Washington's crossing of this river during the Revolutionary War, at least twice in the mid 1800s. It has been copied, reimagined, and parodied by generations of artists since. But A, the Delaware River, B, Hudson River, C, Mississippi River, D, Potomac River. Apparently that was an easy one for you guys. You all answered so quickly. Question number two. Paintings by this American Impressionist capture the lives of women in the late 19th century France. Is it A, Barrett Marizeau, B, Lila Cabot Perry, C, Louise Catherine Bazlau, or D, Mary Cassatt? Paintings by this American Impressionist capture the lives of women in late 19th century France. A, Berthe Marizeau, B, Lila Cabot Perry, C, Louise Catherine Brazel, or D, Mary Cassatt. Question number three. I love this one. This father of the American studio glass movement grew up near Corning Glassworks in New York where his own father was head of research and development. A, Dale Chihuly, B, Harvey Littleton, C, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, D, Thurman Statham. This father of the American Studio Glass Movement grew up near the Corning Glass Works in New York where his own father was head of research and development. A, Dale Chihuly, B, Harvey Littleton, C, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, or D, Thurman Statum. Question number four. Working in media as varied as photography, printmaking, film, painting, 
quilt making, and more. This conceptual artist explores challenges faced by African Americans in the 20th and 21st centuries. A, Glenn Ligon, B, Hank Willis Thomas, C, Kehinde Wiley, or D, Micheline Thomas. Working in media as varied as photography, printmaking, film, painting, quilt making, and more, this conceptual artist explores challenges faced by African Americans in the 20th and 21st centuries. A, Glenn Ligon, B, Hank Willis Thomas, D, Kehinde Wiley, or D, Micheline Thomas. Question number five. This sculptor of both African American and American Indian descent worked most of her career in Rome, Italy to escape the prejudice that plagued her formative years in the US. A, Augusta Savage, B, Beverly Buchanan, C, Edmonia Lewis, or D, Elizabeth Catlett. This sculptor of both African American and American Indian descent worked most of her career in Rome, Italy to escape the prejudice that plagued formative years in the US. A, Augusta Savage, B, Beverly Buchanan, C, Edmonia Lewis, or D, Elizabeth Catlett. Okay, now for round three bonus questions provided by Burial Beer. How many breweries are in the US? Is it A, 3,000, B, 7,500, or C, 10,000? How many breweries are in the USA? A, 3,000, B, 7,500, or C, 10,000? Wonderful. Okay, well that is the end of round three. The questions are getting a little trickier, but I do hope the visual cues helped. We are now going to welcome assistant curator Whitney Richardson. I hear we have some great bar themed items in the museum's collection. Is that right, Whitney? That's right, we do. Let's see, I'm trying to share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint for you all to look at. Oh, wonderful. This is um, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Oh no, we have to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we will have you a co host very soon. Okay, no problem. There it goes. Try it again. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Whitney. Um, since this evening's program is uh, centered on craft, we've got um, craft beer and we're learning about the craft of glass making. I thought I'd highlight a favorite set of mine uh, of objects in the craft collection at the Asheville Art Museum. And here I've brought us back into the intersections in American art um, in our SECU gallery. Um, and so I thought we'd look at this silver cocktail set by William Waldo Dodge Jr. Um, lived in Asheville for most of his life. Um, and this piece is currently um, on display just as you see it here. And I can't wait to welcome you all back to see it soon. Uh, William Waldo Dodge studied architecture at MIT. And he first came to Asheville to recover from injuries he'd sustained in World War I. Um, he was at Oteen Hospital where he participated in silversmithing as occupational therapy to recover. Um, it was there that he met his wife, who was the silversmith teacher. Um, and the two returned to New England after he healed, um, where they were married and worked at Gaylord Silver in Connecticut. Um, when they returned to Asheville together, it was 1924, and he opened Asheville Silvercraft 
uh, which remained open until 1927, when he opened a shop in his own name called Dodge Silver. Um, and that remained in business until the beginning of World War II or into World War II in 1942. And you can see here um, a photograph of Dodge Silver. This is the exterior. It's in Biltmore Forest and the building is still standing today. All right, here you've got an interior shot of Dodge Silver in Biltmore Forest. And I want everyone to notice on the right what he's selling there. He's got um, a cocktail shaker and cups and a tray, a little bit taller than the one we have in the museum, but pretty similar. Here's another view and another cocktail shaker um, and glass set you can see right in that on that center platform as you walk in. So he certainly made a variety of sizes and styles of those to sell. Here's a close up of ours. Um, the, it include, what we've included in it is a shaker, two cups, although there are more, and a tray. Uh, all of these pieces were made between 1929 and 31. Um, at Dodge Silver. You can see the handmade nature of these pieces, um, especially the hammer texture on the shaker and the cups, and the waterfall edge is what he called around the edge of the tray. Um, it has that sort of ripple effect and looks like water. This really became um, a trademark style of his. Here's another image. Um, inside the Dodge Silver workshop, um, he's the one in the middle with the white shirt and tie on. You can see him there. They all have pipes sticking out of their mouths. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think it's really fun at the top center of this image, you can see an old sign for Asheville Silvercraft, which was the store he had before Dodge Silver. Here, I just wanted to give you a little bit clearer picture of the shaker so you could all see that hammer texture effect all all done by hand by um, either Dodge or one of the silversmiths in the shop. And then the two cups there. Um, these are really nice. All right, and then also in this case, um, with the cocktail set are these two pieces, um, which seemed appropriate to go with the 1920s drinking set. We have a matchbox holder, um, which was made at Asheville Silvercraft, so it's a little older. And you can see it's got WWD, it belonged to William Waldo Dodge himself. Um, and this would just slip over a small paper matchbox. Um, and then the other thing, um, any guesses on what this is? This is actually a cigarette holder. And you oh. can loosen and tighten the little strap around it um, to insert your cigarette, and then you don't have to hold the cigarette um, by your hand. And then here we go. Um, I'll end with another look at the exterior of Dodge Silver. Um, this was taken around 1928, so just after he'd opened the shop. Um, and thanks to everyone for participating tonight. Thanks so much, Whitney. If you have any questions for Whitney, please chop them, put them in the chat box and we'll have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. Great, I'll open up the chat. All right, now we are going to review answers from round three. Round three, question one. Emmanuel Loitz's Washington Crossing, the Delaware River, is an icon of 19th century American painting. There have been some hilarious send-ups over the years. I'm sure everyone has seen some of those on social media, some memes as well. Question two. American artist Mary Cassatt spent the majority of her career in Paris, painting seeds of female life. Question three, the studio glass movement is near and dear to my heart personally, uh, and Harvey Littleton is known as its father. He lived and taught by at nearby Penland School of Crafts, where I grew up. Right, question number four. Now this one was super tricky. You're not alone if you felt that way. The answer is Hank Willis Thomas. Although both he and Glenn Ligon have I Am A Man themed works, the visual poem we showed was by Thomas. Question five, the answer is Edmonia Lewis. All the African-American women artists we mentioned are extraordinary. And a couple lived abroad. Lewis was born in New York in 
1844 and died in the UK in 1907. The sculpture we showed was the death of Cleopatra. And finally, the bonus question, there are 7,500 breweries in the US. We're lucky to have some of the finest here in Asheville. How did you guys do? Are you ready for round four, our final round? Let's get started. As you know, we're a museum of 20th and 21st century American art with a special focus in art, Western North Carolina and Southern Appalachia. So far, we've not asked any questions about Black Mountain College because we are saving them for their very own round. Black Mountain College was an experience, experiment in liberal arts education in nearby Black Mountain, about 15 miles east of Asheville, operating from 1933 to 1957. It was an incubator for contemporary artists with a legacy that lives on strongly today. About one quarter of our collection is Black Mountain College related. Okay, ready? Here is question one. This power couple built the art program at Black Mountain College, teaching a variety of hands-on courses from 1933 to 1949. Is it A, Ani and Yosef Albers, B, Dorothea Tanning and Max Ernst, C, Elaine and Wilhelm de Kooning, or D, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. This power couple built the art program at Black Mountain College, teaching a variety of hands-on courses from 1933 to 1949. A, Ani and Yosef Albers, B, Dorothea Tanning and Max Ernst, C, Elaine and Wilhelm de Kooning, or D, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. Wonderful. Okay, question two. Which of these artists was not at one time a faculty member at Black Mountain College? A, Buckminster Fuller. B, Franz Klein. C, Gwendolyn Knight. D, Ruth Asawa. Which of these artists was not at one time a faculty member at Black Mountain College? A, Buckminster Fuller, B, Franz Klein, C, Gwendolyn Knight, or D, Ruth Asawa. Question number three. Karen Karn's work in this medium challenged the notions of functional versus sculptural objects. A, ceramic, B, silver, C, textiles, D, wood. Karen Karn's work in this medium challenged the notions of functional versus sculptural objects. A, ceramic, B, silver, C, textiles, or D, wood. Question number four. After staging Sadie Ruse of the Medusa, starring Buckminster Fuller, choreography by Merce Cunningham, and music by John Cage, this Black Mountain College alum went on to direct some of the most iconic films of the 20th century, such as Alice's Restaurant, Bonnie and Clyde. A, Arthur Penn. B, Billy Wilder. C, Mike Nichols. Or D, Sidney Pollock. After staging Sadie Rose's Ruse of the Medusa, starring Buckminster Fuller, choreography choreography by Merce Cunningham, and music by John Cage, this Black Mountain College alum went on to direct some of the most iconic films of the 20th century, such as Alice's Restaurant and Bonnie and Clyde. A, Arthur Penn. B, Billy Wilder. C, Mike Nichols. D, Sidney Pollack.
Question number five. Paintings by this godfather, actor's father, who studied at Black Mountain College from 1939 to 1940, is collected by major museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. A, Al Pacino. B, Marlon Brando. C, Robert De Niro. Or D, Robert Duvall. Paintings by this godfather, actor's father, who studied at Black Mountain College from 1939 to 1940, is collected by major museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. A, Al Pacino. B, Marlon Brando. C, Robert De Niro. D, Robert Duvall. A lot of Roberts. Okay, now for round four question, bonus question by Varial Veer. Where slash why did the popular beer style get the name India Pale Ale? A, beer was sent to India with extra hops to help preserve the liquid during the long trip. B, the style originated in India. Or C, the person who founded the style was inspired by the traditions of India. Where slash why did the popular beer style get the name India Pale Ale? A, beer was sent to India with extra hops to help preserve the liquid during the long trip. B, the style originated in India. C, the person who founded the style was inspired by the traditions of India. Great, okay, well now it's time for our Q&A portion of this. And I think that Hayden might be back and he wants to show us a finished product. Is that right, Hayden? Yes, hold on. I Did you run out to the Verizon store and get a new phone? I got it, no, 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 I just had to uh, put it in a bucket of water. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Here, let's see, so this is the annealing oven so this holds at about 900 degrees. And so the finished product, as you can see there, that was my test one, that's the one I made. Um, and it sits at about 900 degrees, and then it slowly cools over, um, over about 12 hours, and it's a process called annealing. So you have to slowly cool soft glass so it doesn't break with thermal stress. So that's that. Great. Um, I also wanted to hear if you wanted to tell us how you got started in glass because we didn't get to ask you any questions since you were cut off. Right. Well, uh, my father is actually a glass blower. Uh, good friends with Devin's father as well. Um, <laughs> I grew up uh, near the Penland School Crafts up in the South Toe Valley, about an hour north of here. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, I kind of grew up in the glass shop. I didn't really pick it up until after I graduated college. I went to UNCA for sculpture and um, got into glass after that um, and found my way into something I love. So now I own my studio in Woodfin and get to make all of my things that I want to make out here. So it's, I feel really lucky. You're living the life, aren't you? It's pretty amazing, yeah. I feel pretty <laughs> blessed. Well, I hope the next time I see you is not over Zoom, but we'll see. <laughs> right, totally, yeah. Uh, we also have a question for David. Um, if we could get him back. Uh, we were all kind of wondering, does the name of the beer give you any sort of artistic inspiration? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, actually, no. Um, the the briefs are like a written uh, explanation of um, the story. It's more like a story uh, that would mm. tell the beginning. Um, Doug comes up with all the names for the beers, and uh, generally, like uh, those can even change at the end, like at the immediate tail end of the process. So um, the names 
they mean a lot to him, but they're really not part of the creative process from, from the beginning. So, um, you know, they could even change, like I said, by the end. So no, they, I don't look for those for inspiration. I get very specific um, notes on what, what we're kind of like looking to work on. Very cool. I think that was a really interesting question. It was a very yeah. good question. Yeah, I've always wondered that myself, actually. Because the things um, are crazy. They're, they're insane. Uh, we have a question for Hayden. If you would allow visitors, perhaps after the pandemic is sort of calmed down. Of course, yeah. Um, you can email me um, through my website, HaydenDakotaWilson.com, or um, I'm sure if you reach out to the art museum, they'll give you my contact info. But yeah, I'd love to host people out here um, and let me know if you need a set of glasses or custom lighting for your house to uh, get you through the pandemic times. Yes, I actually just broke my uh, last Hayden Wilson. Well, my dad broke it, so blame him, Hayden. <laughs> oh, actually, I can't hear you. Are you, you oh, muted again? Sorry, it keeps muting. Um, now I can hear you. I will get you more. I make, I make a lot of them, so that's the best part about glass is it, it breaks, so it keeps me in business. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, we have a question for Chris. We, we actually want to know how Burial comes up with some of the names for their beers. Chris, can you speak to that? Um, am I muted still? I'm no, you're on. <laughs> um, gosh, it's, it's hard to explain. I mean, it's typically a... Uh, it's either coming straight out of Doug's head or it's a brainstorming session. <laughs> what do those look like? <laughs> uh, typically ever some beers, um, always burial beer, <laughs> but Fun, yeah. no, I, it is a, you know, we, we draw names from a lot of different sources. Um, certainly a lot of them come from, um, music and, um, seasons and obviously there are a huge amount of death elements to it um but it is yeah we we typically try and uh certainly incorporate artwork that in you know involves the name and um and, and draws into any variety of elements it's oftentimes comes straight out of doug's mind those brainstorming sessions really sound fun <laughs> <laughs> a little jealous. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that. Um, they also want to know if you have a favorite burial beer. That might be a hard question for you, though, Chris. Um, I have been drinking probably more inner tube these days than anything else. Um, gets me through the the warmer months. And then, in terms of uh, you know, IPAs, it's all it's it's hard to beat Surf Wax. I uh, I like that one. I also love, um, you yeah, know, we put, put out Ocean Swallows the Sun, Sour recently, which was delicious. Um, and then right now we're in the midst of skillet season, which is always a, always a fun time. And we just released all of those yesterday in Asheville and then online this morning and sold out in a matter of minutes. So we've had, oh, a, had a lot of fun switching to online sales, but definitely looking forward to getting the tap rooms open and getting Aren't we all? <laughs> I actually think we have a question in the box. They're asking if you can send to Pennsylvania. So it's perfect that you started mentioning your online sales. Pennsylvania, I believe we can. Let me uh, let me just check real fast. We um, we have gone through a few iterations of where we can and cannot send beer, but right now I believe Pennsylvania is on the list. Oh, good. I know that they're a little bit more strict than other states. Yeah, Pennsylvania's good. We, we, we ran into a little bit of an issue up there, but we were able to resolve it within a couple of weeks. Oh, perfect. I think yeah. David wants a, a shipment, if you can get that together. He's been very active in the chat box. <laughs> Are you guys not paying him in beer? He needs Gosh, man, we're money and he needs beer. I thought Courtney was sending you everything these days. <laughs> Nothing He's like shaking it. his head no. Um, we have a question for Whitney. Someone wants to know what your favorite part of the collection is. There we go. Um, my favorite part of the collection is all of our craft pieces. Um, glass, ceramics, textiles, um, 
everything that makes up the craft collection. You are the expert for sure. All right, does anyone else have any more questions? Anything I missed? I know that they're putting a lot of sites and Instagram handles in the chat, which is great. We also have all the links on the website on our calendar event to Hayden's website, David's website, as well as Burial. So if you are interested in ordering, I'm sure that you could find it through there. We do have a question. Hayden, if you feel comfortable sharing, someone wants to know what your electrical bill is. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You're a little bit faint, but yes. Okay, my uh, my my furnace is actually electric, so it's quite high. So I've got my electric furnace and my ovens. Um, it ranges between nine hundred and about eleven hundred dollars a month. So it's not a cheap thing to have on. So I gotta stay productive. So you just let me know when you need uh, some cocktail glasses. <laughs> Or craft beer glasses. You won't be sorry. They are quite amazing. Um, we're getting a lot of questions if we're going to keep doing trivia nights or more online virtual programming, and the answer is yes. Um, but I'm just going to give you a teaser that we will have more things planned. So please stay tuned to the website on social, and you'll definitely see um, some of the fun things we have going. And without further ado, I think it's time for us to review round four answers. So before we conclude, let's go over these answers for the Black Mountain College round. All of these artist works can be found here at the museum, if you're interested. Question number one, the answer was Ani and Yosef Albers. Is that one too easy for you guys? Or do we throw you off with the other options that were? Also pretty good answers. Question number two, while all of these artists were associated with Black Mountain College, only one of them was not a faculty member, and that was Ruth Asawa. Question three, Black Mountain College faculty member Karen Carnes ceramics challenged the notion of functional versus sculptural objects. Question five, while all of these actors are well remembered for their roles, the Godfather, it was De Niro's father, Robert De Niro Sr., who studied at Black Mountain College. And finally, the bonus question, where did the name India Pale Ale come from? It's because beer was sent to India with extra hops to help preserve the liquid during the long trip. Evan, you missed question four. Now let's add it up. How did you guys do on each round. How'd you do overall? Who won at home? Was it friendly or did it get a little contentious? Um, for those of you playing competitively, remember that we'll announce the first, second, and third player place winners tomorrow on our website and social media. So stay tuned for that. And just in case technology is not our friend, please hang on to those score sheets. Also, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to our guests, Hayden, Chris, David, and Whitney. We'd also like to thank our friends at Perspective Cafe by Food Experience for their contributions to this virtual event. An extra special shout out to Burial for your help in creating tonight's program. I hope we can actually visit you at the tap room again soon. We'll also be sending an evaluation to collect your feedback on this evening's program. So please watch our email. Museum hope and hopes to reopen sometime in June or July, depending on Governor Cooper's orders. We are paying very close attention to that. So please stay tuned for more information uh, coming to your inbox. If you're not already on our email list but would like to be added, please send us a note or sign up on our homepage, ashevilleart.org. In the meantime, I hope you keep enjoying our museum from homepage, our activities that are listed on there, virtual programs. We'll continue offering them for the foreseeable future. So I think that's good news for everyone here. And thank you all again for your support. Stay well and have a great rest of your week. Happy Thursday.